Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live on this Monday afternoon. I'm Shauna Smith along with Dave Briggs and Pross Subramanian. Let's get you up to speed on today's market action because the selling that we saw to start the day has certainly been accelerating in the final couple hours of trading. We're now looking at losses for the Dow off just about 300 points. And taking a look at the intraday chart, you can see we're just bouncing off the lows of the day. The S&P lower for the fourth trading day in a row, looking at losses of just over 1%. Taking a look at the NASDAQ 100, the worst performer of the three major averages off well above uh, well over one and a half a percent today taking a look at some of the other moves playing out let's take a look at the action in the bond market we're looking at yields moving to the upside up another 10 basis points today at 358 the same is true for the 30-year yield that's up about nine basis points at 362 taking a look at some of the action that we're seeing play out in the energy markets crude back above 75 bucks a barrel we're looking at a gain of just over one percent today a number of crypto headlines that will get into later in this hour, but Bitcoin back below 17,000, off just about 1% today. Let's take a look at the sector action because all 11 of the S&P sectors moving to the downside this afternoon. The biggest losses coming from communication services, consumer discretionary and technology. Some concern about the rising risk of recession, how aggressive the Fed is going to be, and then also the focus on a couple of key earnings that we will be getting tomorrow after the bell. We have FedEx and Nike. And taking a look at some of the losses from big, big tech. You can see that within the NASDAQ 100, a lot of the larger cap tech names in the red. You have Apple off nearly 2%, Microsoft off over 2% today, and Amazon, Dave, down nearly 4%. Closer we get to Christmas, I know. the further Santa feels. Thank you, Shana. Let's get you up to speed now on the housing market. This is a very key week of data kicking off, well, on a down note. Confidence among U.S. single-family home builders fell for a record 12th straight month. The National Association of Home Builders Index dropping to 31 this month. For context, it takes a reading above 50 to be considered good. With the exception of the early months of COVID, December's read is the lowest in a decade. We'll get a glimpse at permits, starts, and existing home sales over the next two days. Pros? Now we want to bring you up to speed on some news out of Washington. The House Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol has referred former President Trump to the Justice Department for criminal charges. The main charges the committee alleges Trump committed are obstruction of an official proceeding, conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to make a false statement, and giving aid or comfort to an insurrection. We'll have more on that later on the referrals in the show. Massive story there, a political earthquake, folks. For more, though, on the markets, we're joined by Allspring Global Investments senior investment strategist, Brian Jacobson. Brian, always good to see you, sir. Want to get back to some of that housing news we just read. With We're talking about NAHB 12 straight months of down readings and the lowest number in a decade other than that blip in early COVID, indicative to you of what? Yeah, I think that it actually is just reflecting the reality of a recession that the United States is likely to go into in 2023. Um, when I look at a variety of different macro factors, I think that we'll, there will probably be a, an official recession uh, probably around Q2, so end of second quarter of 2023. Arguably, we already had one at the beginning of 2022, so this might be a type of double dip. And uh, it's been bad for housing. You know, housing Housing has been down uh, for, I think it's been more than eight fiscal quarters in a row as far as on an inflation adjusted basis. Initially, it was due to lack of workers, right? So there was uh, just uh, too much work for them to do, but they couldn't find anybody to do the work. And now we've got higher interest rates and going into a period of time in which not only do you have some of these supply side constraints, but also probably some demand destruction that's likely to take place. So kind of a, a triple whammy there for housing. Yeah, certainly housing has been under pressure. Really, the broader market has been under pressure over the last several trading days. The S&P now lower for the fourth day in a row. Brian, is there any chance that maybe we could get a rally into the end, end of the year? Any good news maybe on the horizon for us? Yeah, so I'm actually somewhat constructive on the idea that we could get an end of year rally with some weakness going into Friday's personal consumption and expenditures data, which is, you know, granted looking backwards. So it's like, what were people spending their money on uh, back in November? What was income? I think that we'll see some weakness there. But then also the, the within that report, you get the inflation indicator that the Fed officially is targeting, the PCE price deflator. And that's likely to show some moderation. So if you've got some weak 
weak consumer spending, weak income growth, weaker inflation, that might sound like a horrible mixture there, but it actually could be a good thing in the sense that it suggests that the Fed might not need to hike quite as much as what people have originally been fearing for 2023. So that could maybe trigger that Santa Claus rally. And remember, the Santa Claus rally, historically, it starts after Christmas, not beforehand. So I, I think that we could be setting ourselves up for at least maybe a little bit of a bounce back to end the year. Hey, Brian Prosser, just want to follow up on that commentary about the Fed and rates. Do you think that the, the doves might see some kind of action here because of the fact that we might see some weaker data coming out of January? I do. And actually, I think that uh, when I looked at the summary of economic projections that the Federal Reserve released, it was really interesting to see the consensus view for where the Fed funds rate should be at the end of 2023. Um, there were 10 participants that thought that it should be around 5.1% or so. So, right, that's a, a, a few more hikes away. There were only a handful uh, that really thought that they needed to have, go materially higher than that. So those are the most hawkish members. They're also the ones that tend to squawk the loudest. Uh, the doves have been a little bit quiet, but I actually think Lael Brainard, um, as the vice chair of the Fed, I think she's in that little bit more dovish camp. I, I prefer to think about it as the more prudent camp to think that we've done a lot already. Let's maybe take a pause and see how things play out. And uh, I suspect that she's actually carrying the majority of the members uh, behind her view here. And it's just a few outliers that are a bit fringe with their views. Quite a burden to carry there. All right, so the implications, given that set up the implications and the layout for the bond market. Well, you know, on my team here at All Spring, on our multi-asset team, we actually have a positive view on the outlook for bonds for 2023. Uh, it requires a little bit of pain that we experienced in 2022, but uh, just historically, when we've looked at periods of a recession, what oftentimes happens, you actually get bonds doing pretty well. What happens when the Fed gets closer to their peak for tightness, which I think we're pretty close to there. Uh, you know, the end isn't uh, necessarily here, but the end is near for rate hikes. And that actually tends to be a very bullish indicator for the bond market. So here, we're actually pretty optimistic about the outlook for the fixed income markets overall. And Brian, when it comes to, I guess, what investors should be watching, the biggest stories right now outside of the Fed, of course, there's also earnings. We have FedEx and Nike after the bell tomorrow. But looking further out into 2023, we certainly have already seen some of those estimates come down just a bit. What are you expecting? And I guess in terms of the leadership, what are you expecting to kind of lead the next like higher potentially? Sure. So I think that we could actually see smaller cap stocks lead the way higher. Um, and, and not to say that you shouldn't be investing across the capitalization spectrum. You know, diversification is wonderful. Uh, it's in the textbooks for a reason. But as far as tilts in that, I think that actually some of the smaller cap companies could experience a decent rebound, but even more so emerging markets. So when I look at the earnings picture, and I think earnings will be the story for the first part of 2023, expectations for the S&P 500 on the sell side, those are only down maybe 6% from their peak. And so that's not a huge move lower. That's about what we saw in 2015, uh, 2016, where you've seen a massive repricing and almost kind of a wipeout of some of the expectations is in emerging markets. Uh, there's uh, basically people are expecting no growth in emerging markets. And those expectations are down about 24% from where they were at the beginning of 2022. So emerging markets, I think, are the ones where you've already seen sort of people just throwing the towel on them. And when people throw in the towel on them, that's where I want to kind of start picking them up. Brian Jacobson, thanks so much, man. Thank you. We're just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, Tesla getting a downgrade as the drama over Elon Musk's Twitter takeover deals Tesla investors another blow. Then the next phase of the streaming wars is taking shape. Find out which platforms are in the best position to succeed. And the CEO of Mesa Airlines tells us why his company is shifting operations from American Airlines to United. Don't go anywhere.
Tesla treading water following a rough week as Oppenheimer says it's seen enough. Analyst Colin Rush downgraded the stock to perform, writing that challenges regarding Twitter have left sentiment towards Tesla, quote, severely damaged. It's not just Musk's share sales that are, over, are an overhang. Rush says its decisions in running Twitter leading to broad public backlash that is pushing Rush, quote, to the sidelines. You know, kind of a sobering note here, kind of laying out the case as to yeah. why, you know, it's not about Tesla, the company. Like, they, he says, like, they have the ability to cut costs where other guys, guys can't do it. Uh, the software and tech prowess is there, but just concern over Musk's sort of, you know, connection to Twitter and that just that public, public backlash there. Yeah, so many positive. I mean, built his own supply chain that is uh, not reliant on other countries. But look, the stock at Tesla is down 30% since that Twitter takeover. And the one thing you just don't want is that that brand, that cult of personality to become bigger than the biggest car company in the world. And that's what it is. I, actually, this is just anecdotal, guys, but I talked to some friends who I live in a Tesla town and I spoke with a few of them and said, does this impact you? And before I even got it out of my mouth, they all said, I absolutely will never buy a Tesla again. I'm really? already looking at what type of VV I'm going to buy next. Now, their politics are obvious, but they don't want to think of a human being. They don't want to think of a politics. They want to think of a machine. And that gets back to this poll that he put out. Uh, Should I step down as head of Twitter? I will abide by the results of the poll. 17 and a half million people voted. That is an astronomical number, and overwhelmingly people said yes. And he also said he will, again, abide by this. My personal belief is he wanted it out here. He oh, would yes. not have put this poll out to his followers if he didn't want to get out from under that enormous burden. Yeah, I think he's using it as a bit of a scapegoat here to kind of say, hey, I put it to you guys. You guys voted and I'm listening to you. This isn't the first time that he's kind of done something similar to this. So I think the fact that he put that out there, the uh, the number of votes, though, that took me by surprise. Over 17 wow. million. Astonishing. But that really shows how much attention this story has attracted, not only from Tesla believers or Musk believers, but people clearly who have been very critical of him. And he's been criticized from Wall Street, a number of analysts, Oppenheimer, the latest downgrading shares are really changing their view of Tesla, saying that right now it's not, cha it's not uh, trading within the line of fundamentals, but also a number of policymakers have come out and questioned what Tesla is doing right now, what Elon Musk is doing, what that could mean for Tesla shareholders. And Senator Warren today is sending a letter to Tesla's board and raising some questions about Elon Musk and Twitter and whether or not his actions are shortchanging Tesla. And within this letter, she wrote, Twitter's desperation for revenue to cover its new debts could also create conflicts when Tesla negotiates with Twitter for advertising space. Mr. Musk could decide that he is personally better served if Tesla overpays Twitter for advertising or pays up front to give Twitter access to much needed cash. Now, it's very important to point out that this is all hyper, uh, mm. hypothetical here, but she does raise some good questions just in terms of Elon Musk for right now, still the CEO of Tesla, still the CEO of Twitter. And if he's too intertwined with both those companies, the risk there that that could potentially pose or maybe already does pose for shareholders of Tesla. Yeah, he owes a, a, a legal duty for his public company to treat the company as, a, as his first loyalty. He can't not, not to the detriment of, 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 of Tesla versus Twitter. Uh, she says that doesn't want Musk to treat Tesla like a private plaything, right? So mm -hmm. taking resources from Tesla, we've seen engineers going from Tesla to Twitter to help them out. That actually is considered sort of, you know, you're taking these resources that you owe towards shareholders to, as it's a public duty. So I think she's kind of, that's her main tack of, of sort of seeing wrongdoing potentially with Tesla and, and Musk and Twitter. So, you know, it's a little out of place. She's not on the board of, of yeah. Tesla. So she's not like a shareholder as far as I know, but I think she's sort of seeing, you know, some public entities do own shareholders or shares in Tesla. So maybe there's some uh, kind of like a way for her to inject herself as a, as a regulator there. But uh, still those, interesting nonetheless. For those on the board, they are watching as GM and Ford and Hyundai and Kia all turn their attention towards the EV market. Are they going to start to lose market share? It's inevitable at this point. In particular, since you look, since late April, he sold $23 billion in shares of Tesla while the auto giants of the world are turning their attention solely towards Tesla. These are two forces that if you are on that board, you are irate and you are beginning to be panicked. Yeah, you certainly are. And I think just the performance of Tesla stock really just illustrates everything that's been going on. We had the three month chart up there just a minute or so ago. And we're looking at losses of over 50% 
in the last three months. But that year-to-date chart showing that's not that different when you take a look at the year-to-date performance off just about 57%. So I think many people at this point would like to see some changes maybe to Twitter and see whether or not that helps get Tesla back on track. All right, well, coming up, Sports League's broadcast rights are pricey, but streaming platforms have been starting to throw their hats into the ring. We will tell you what might happen in 2023 next. Media companies are no longer going all in on content. According to the research firm Ampere Analysis, TV networks and streaming companies are buying far fewer adult scripted series, down 24% for the second half of the year. Yahoo Finance reporter Ali Canal here with what's next for the industry as a whole. Ali, where are we headed? Yeah, where we're heading, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in 2023 because 2022 was a much slower year for media M&A. That's due to a variety of reasons, one being the fact that the Fed hiked interest rates seven times so far this year. That's automatically going to pressure deal making. We did see the closing of some pretty big deals like Warner Brothers Discovery, Amazon's acquisition of MGM. But moving ahead into 2023, there is this expectation that although there will be less, there is certainly going to be a lot of activity. I spoke with a few experts. There's also a new report out from PwC, and they really elaborated on what's going to drive media M&A, one being sports rights and sports adjacent industries like sports gambling. The issue there, though, is that sports rights are very competitively priced, and a lot of these media giants, they are pulling back spending. Wall Street wants to make sure that you're profitable. They're not spending nearly as much as they did in year 
years past. So that's going to be an interesting story to watch in 2023. Some other things, uh, other types of media M&A could include video games, that proven intellectual property going a long way there. Also repurposed theaters. Could a streaming giant potentially buy a theater chain? That's something that could be possible. And we've heard from these prominent media executives, Paramount CEO Bob Backish, Jason Kyler, former head of Warner Media. They all agree that consolidation is happening. The question is the timeline. And Kyler hinted that that timeline is pretty quick. He said in two years, we're really going to have three major players. So it's something that we're going to have to watch. We've heard rumblings that potentially Warner Brothers Discovery could sell itself again or perhaps sell more parts of itself. We also have some of those smaller players like WWE, uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul. Maybe some of the bigger players will gobble them up. And then with Disney, ESPN, do you spin it off? Do you sell Hulu to Comcast? So I do think Wall Street is going to be on these companies' tails. You want to be profitable. M&A, one of the more practical ways to get there. And a lot of question marks for a lot of these media companies. Everybody kind of stand around looking for a dance mm -hmm. partner. In that exactly. In time. Ali Canal, good stuff. Thank you. All right, well, another focus in 2023 in the streaming landscape is going to be sports because it has emerged as a key battleground for streamers, platforms willing to spend big bucks on rights. But there may be a limit just in terms of how much they're willing to pay. There's a new report from Puck, and that says that Apple is now dropping out of the NFL Sunday ticket negotiations because they don't, quote, see the logic. Lots of questions about the price and exactly what they would be getting if they did pay up for that price. So to bring in more on this, we want to bring in Tim Nolan, Macquarie Group, senior media tech analyst. And Tim, let's just start with the streaming landscape, the role of sports here, the implications that this means if Apple, in fact, is now out of these negotiations. How does that set up the industry heading into the new year? Well, I won't speak to Apple specifically. It's not a stock that I cover, but I did see the news uh, this morning as well that they're backing out of the Sunday ticket, which, of course, is, I mean, it's extremely expensive um, a package of content. Um, you know, Apple does have a few other bits and pieces of rights. I mean, actually, a fairly substantial uh, Major League Soccer deal, um, as well as um, some a little bit of exclusive uh, Major League Baseball. But, um, you know, the sports world is moving towards streaming now. Um, you know, you had Disney launch uh, ESPN Plus already a few years ago, really as kind of a complementary adjacent service to the ESPN linear package. And at the time, it was positioned as, well, we have so much uh, sports content, uh, we being ESPN, so much so that we can't put it all onto our linear channel. So we're going to launch the streaming service and have kind of a lot of the extra stuff out of market games and some maybe less popular sports. And ESPN Plus has done, I would say, quite well. I've always viewed this as a precursor to one day having a fully over-the-top ESPN. I still don't think we're there yet. Um, we've got some major sports deals that have been done in the past. Um, NFL actually has the new contract starting next year. Uh, major League Baseball um, is in the midst. Now, the one big contract that is coming up is the NBA, and ESPN and the Turner Networks uh, split most of that. And so that will be interesting to watch over the next, let's say, year to two, whatever the contract negotiation time frame is, to what extent uh, the streaming services will actually incorporate uh, more rights to that and how indeed they would try to make more money out of it. Uh, you know, at ESPN, of course, this could be another major sports right that could push them a little bit closer to thinking about either a package of sports being exclusively over the top or maybe all of ESPN eventually. And then Warner Brothers Discovery, uh, of course, runs HBO Max and they also own the Turner Networks. And as HBO Max is trying to better firmly establish itself as a must-have streaming service to include some really high quality, high in demand sports content within that uh, could be very, very interesting for that platform. So that's something to watch over the course of the next uh, year or whatever the negotiation terms are for the NBA. I want to circle back uh, on the NFL deal, but first to follow up on the NBA, do you expect ESPN to lock that deal? And if they do not, what does it mean for them going forward? It's an important uh, it's an important package of rights, uh, both for ESPN and for the Turner Networks, and of course both both companies um, are still milking their linear channels. Um, you know, it's it's I mean, sports is a very important part of, of basically having a linear presence at all. Um, so they're they're my guess is uh, they do their best to try to keep that contract. They point to the legacy, the history of doing well with it uh, for the league for themselves. 
and they try to incorporate more streaming rights into uh, into the contract. The math, though, is is difficult. I mean, it's it's high priced rights. The NBA is probably going to be looking to at least double the price of the total package. Um, you know, linear subscribers are falling by the wayside. Uh, streaming subscribers are still growing. Uh, it's competitive, but they're still growing. And over time, more sports could help to attract more users to those platforms. How they'll make enough money, you know, to justify double or whatever the price increase is, you know, you'd think they'd have to double their cost of streaming. So yeah, the, the price for the streaming services. So um, another trick to actually try to make this work is uh, better advertising technology. Um, you know, ad tech is actually a very vibrant field. Um, and uh, there's a lot of money to be made by targeting advertising effectively. Uh, a lot of work still to be done in getting that through. But that is one way that the streaming services could try to make more money to try to at least get close to where they were once on the linear side. Hey, Tim, speaking of ads, I want to mention Netflix here, that new ad tier product. Do people actually want that or are willing to pay less in order to suffer through ads? Like, I don't think I can do that. <laughs> Well, you know, it's three dollars less than the base uh, than, than the base was up until this came on. I don't know about you, but what I found very interesting was, and I'm a Netflix subscriber. I never once got a promotion for the new ad supported tier. I was very surprised about that. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I missed it. But you would have thought they would have been promoting this more to try to get people to sign up for it. But I think um, Netflix is in a bit of a quandary here in getting the service on off the ground in that you know they are diluting themselves by trying to convert their US subscriber base to um, an ad supported plan. It's three dollars less per month. That's three dollars less per subscriber right there. They have to make up for that with ad sales. To have good ad sales, you have to have uh, a large audience. I mean everyone says oh Netflix is a huge it's 74 million subscribers in the US and Canada. The current number of paying advertising supported subscribers, whatever that number is right now, is a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of that. So advertisers are only getting however many hundred thousand, I don't know how many subscribers there are in the first six weeks. So the first trick is to sort of get to a balance where they have enough subscribers to that advertising tier that they can go out to advertisers with that audience figure and then be able to sell ads on the back of that. Um, so, you know, it, it, my best guess is it just takes some time. Um, 2023 for Netflix may be, I don't know, neutral-ish, let's say, in terms of incremental revenue. It's not really until 24 or 25 that they might actually start to make um, some incremental revenue from the ad tier. And Tim, what happens if Netflix, in fact, isn't able to capitalize off the ad tier and loses some more momentum going forward? How much trouble then is Netflix going to be in? And then to push that point even further, the odds of Netflix potentially merging with another player in the space, do you think that that is likely over the next year or two? Um, in terms of failing, um, I don't think they will, uh, although you know, how do you define what success really means? They've never put any sort of targets, you know, or guidance, you know, out there in terms of what they expect the service to deliver. Um, you know, we have estimated at a base case, they can add an incremental, you know, single digits percentage to their revenue. Um, so it's not a completely transformational game changer for Netflix, but it should be revenue enhancing. And because advertising uh, is very high margin business, it should be even more earnings enhancing for Netflix. Again, over time, we really don't expect much in 2023, but 24 and 25. If it fails, meaning if they dilute themselves and they're not able to attract the advertising, they're going to have to get more aggressive with how they do that advertising. So my point on advertising technology is rather than using traditional TV type of you know, insertion orders, they have to go to fully programmatic ad placements, using the data at hand, using the technology, using the ad tech partners that they could get to know better to really deliver those larger audiences and those higher value of ads. If this doesn't work, um, you know, I think the stock will will suffer because part of the recovery story for Netflix stock is getting this advertising tier to work. Interesting road ahead, no doubt. Tim Nolan, good to see you. Great information. Appreciate that. Coming up, Nike shares taking a hit a day before it reports earnings. We'll tell you what investors want to hear after the break.
Time for our triple play. Three stocks that we're watching in the final 25 minutes. We have Moderna, Uber, and Nike. Let's kick it off with Moderna. Jeffrey's upgrading the stock to buy and raising its price target by over 100 bucks to 275 a share, noting, quote, a significant new pipeline story and also catalyst ahead. Now, Jeffrey's is bullish for two reasons. One, the promising results that we got last week from the preliminary study of its mRNA cancer vaccine. Now, Jeffrey's also sees Moderna's RSV vaccine results as a catalyst for shares. This stock is down year-to-date pros, but over the last six months, shares are up 47% year-to-date losses, just about 25%. So at least the last six months, momentum seems to be heading in the right direction and on the heels of the, prelim of the preliminary results last week. It seems like a number of analysts now have a more positive or optimistic outlook on the stock heading into the new year. Yeah, a big, big comeback for Moderna. You know, big pandemic play. Uh, that RSV stuff, very interesting, as we see sort of this tridemic happen right now in this country, people looking to get into that and, and people actually looking to get boosted by those, mm -hmm. that potential treatment there. Um, uh, speaking of the pandemic, uh, Uber, I'm watching Uber today. Uber drivers striking today in New York, protesting over the company's move to block a pay hike passed by New York's Taxi and Limo Commission. Drivers formed a caravan across the Brooklyn Bridge during morning rush hour, giving up pay to show their displeasure over that New York judge granting Uber a temporary restraining order over that raise that was supposed to take place on Monday, affecting 80,000 drivers. Now, I took an Uber this morning to work, and there was actually plenty of them Fancy out of there. You. Well, you know, I had to get from A to B pretty quickly. But there was uh, plenty of drivers out there, so I'm not sure if they can actually mobilize. Like, you know, without a new union, they can't mobilize everybody to strike yeah. uh, and cause, you know, some kind of My life. thoughts exactly. They don't have a whole lot of leverage here because there's an army of Uber drivers just waiting to take their mm -hmm. place right behind them and flip their switch on if you go off. I, in fact, have been watching it all day, and I was shocked to see Uber prices below their usual rate. And Uber rarely puts that on their app, but they put it on three different times when I looked, clearly sending a signal, we're not impacted by that. But they say they did impact a 20 to $23 million charge if that pay raise went in, and that would raise prices by 10% here in New York City. Prices have already gone up dramatically on the Uber app, so we'll see. It doesn't appear to be working so well. My play is Nike set to report earnings tomorrow. Excess Inventory, the issue looming over that report after ending Q1 up 44% in inventory from the prior year. The result, a likely hit to margins after widespread markdowns at Nike, said Morgan Stanley, quote, we expect Nike likely takes advantage of potentially stronger than expected North American sportswear demand to clear through excess apparel inventory. So they're uh, a little bit upbeat there. On consider this note, tail one, one tailwind to consider holiday season will be impacted by the absence of Adidas branded Yeezy products gone now after cutting ties with Kanye West in October. Also, the reopening of China will certainly help them a bit. Analysts expect EPS of 65 sets revenue, 12.57 billion. Shares are down ahead of this report, about 3% and down 37%. This year, I think, Shana, this is really a short-term, long-term story. It looks like they're going to have to continue to work through those inventory issues, discounting. But the long run, you really got to like the equity, the brand identification and loyalty that Nike has. Yeah, certainly. I think it's more of a longer-term play because when you take into account some of the issues facing them, you mentioned inventory, supply chain, China, the weakness over there. Revenue expectations are for $1.8 billion. I think a number of analysts want to get a little bit more commentary from N Nike executives just in terms of what they see playing out in China, more specifically over the next quarter or two. And then more broadly, what we're seeing here amid higher inflation, whether or not people have been starting to pull back on spending, any early reads that we're getting of the holiday season, I think could potentially really move this name uh, tomorrow night. I think you mentioned the fact that it's such a great franchise. And here, as we head into the holiday quarter, what's going to happen here? What do they see coming up? I think that's going to be good to hear, too. Yeah. yeah, certainly it will be a name to watch. All right, well, coming up next, nearly two-thirds of Americans say that they don't see their personal financial situations getting any better next year. We will tell you what's weighing on consumers next.
Hot inflation and the Fed's rate hike campaign have challenged Americans when it comes to their personal finances this year. And according to some new data, many people don't expect 2023 to be 2023 to be any easier. Excuse me. A recent survey by Bankrate.com shows that roughly two thirds of Americans don't expect their personal finances to improve next year, with nearly 30 percent believing their situation will actually get worse. Joining us now for more is Greg McBride, Bankrate.com's chief financial analyst. Greg, what is going on here exactly? In a word, inflation. Uh, when we ask people, why do you not feel your finances are going to improve next year? By more than a two to one margin over anything else, people singled out inflation. And of course, it's strained and stretched household budgets in 2022. But, you know, very clearly, there's not a whole lot of optimism on the part of consumers that they feel that's going to improve in any meaningful way next year. Uh, a, a number of disparities, uh, really interesting numbers in this, in particular, the racial gap here, Greg, and, and black Americans are far more uh, optimistic than our whites, 32 to 15. What do you make of that racial gap? Yeah, that was very surprising, but, you know, I think encouraging at the same time, uh, you know, one of the things you hear Fed Chair Jerome Powell talk about uh, again and again is you know, closing uh, the, the, the gap uh, between various racial groups in terms of things like unemployment uh, and, and income levels. So, uh, you know, seeing that higher level of optimism, I think, is uh, certainly encouraging. Greg, you mentioned inflation being the primary reason for that gloomy outlook outside of inflation. What are consumers, what are Americans most worried about? Uh, to a much lesser extent, they were singling out you know, work done by elected representatives, uh, stagnant wages or re reduced income, which could be a nod to a potential uh, downturn or a recession next year, uh, and changing interest rates. Of course, interest rates have gone up dramatically this year. Fed is still signaling they're going to raise rates some more. So, you know, those were the other uh, common reasons, but, you know, by a, a quite a distant margin relative to inflation. Hey, Greg, do you think most Americans are expecting a pay, pay hike next year? Are they expecting to see higher wages come through? Yeah, we had done a poll on this a couple of months ago, and, and what we had found is that most people said that even those that had gotten raises, it wasn't keeping up with inflation. And I, you know, I think that really just kind of sums up the state. The, the pace of wage growth that we've seen is the best in 20 years, but you don't notice it because it's just being totally swamped by inflation. Buying power of households is being squeezed. And, you know, that that certainly contributes to the, the level of pessimism that you're seeing in this poll. No question. And Greg, I mentioned the racial gap also different generationally. How does that optimism change uh, with age? Yeah, this was interesting. I mean, what we did see is a much higher level of optimism among Gen Z and millennial workers uh, relative to their Gen X or, or baby boomer counterparts. And, and the reasons for feeling that way were also different. What we noticed among the, uh, the, the Gen Z and the millennials was uh, you know, a greater propensity not only to be optimistic about their finances, but because they felt like they were going to make more money at work. Uh, when we look at the Gen Xers and, and baby boomers, they were much more likely to have a pessimistic outlook on their finances next year. And that's where inflation really reared its head. And of course, when you look at baby boomers either in retirement or nearing retirement, the prospect of inflation when you're on a fixed income, I mean, that's really your worst enemy. And we certainly see that reflected in the numbers. Greg, how has all this shaped financial goals next year, just in terms of what people are willing and maybe not willing to spend their money on over the next several months? Yeah, this was interesting because what we normally see is a lot of, for example, prioritizing about saving for retirement. That's often one of the biggest regrets uh, that people have financially. But I think the goals that people have laid out really, uh, I think, are, are indicative of uh, the economic environment. Uh, paying down debt was number one. Budgeting their spending better was second. And saving more for emergencies was third. And, and I think those are really the three pillars that – if we were going to talk about how to insulate your finances from an economic downturn, that's where you would start. You'd pay down debt. You'd keep a close eye on your budget, watch your spending, and, and then boost your emergency savings so that you can weather whatever might come economically. Greg McBride, thanks so much. It's interesting, Praz. One thing I want to zero in here is, is the age that I pointed out. According to their numbers, the older you get, the more pessimistic you get about your financial future. What I can't quite figure out or glean from the data is that because of what stocks and bonds have done over the past year, both turning negative only the fifth time since 28, or is this simply a reflection of 
you get older, you get closer to retirement. That really surprised me. I thought Gen Z would be more pessimistic. They're the ones taking on four or five jobs that have to drive an Uber to make things meet. Can't really, uh, we can't draw a correlation, causation from this. Yeah, exactly. And when you take a look at millennials, millennials, millennials are amongst with the Gen Zers a little bit more optimistic just in terms of what they're expecting in the next year. When you take a look, a number of millennials came out of college. They graduated right around the Great Recession. They've gone through a number of layoffs. They've seen what has happened over the last several months with a, more and more tech companies laying off workers. We're starting to see that maybe play out in other industries. I was surprised at the percentage of them that were so optimistic and this is my generation so i'm speaking just for how i personally am viewing this right now i mean you're seeing prices raise in almost every single aspect of your life moody's was out with a recent report saying that inflation has boosted household spending by 433 dollars a month that's a so lot explain of the money. optimism i don't please. get it i don't i i don't know why maybe they're out of touch some people are out of touch <laughs> oh, they're too optimistic who knows i mean you know now they're starting to kind of like have kids get married right and then maybe and that'll, the expenses that'll are piling that, on. That'll, yeah, maybe that'll change as they sort of do those I things. Don't know. You know. I, I'm not feeling more optimistic. I can explain the pessimism of my generation, but you're not. I mean, I know. I know. <laughs> I'm not doing a good job. I, I, don't, I don't share in their optimistic outlook, at least for now. At least maybe for now. Maybe that'll right. change. Maybe it's the crypto. I don't know. <laughs> Speaking of that, coming up, the collapse of FTX leads to a billion dollar acquisition for Binance. We'll have the details on that when we come back. Sam Bankman freed back in a Bohemian court today. Extradition to the United States remaining a key question as we move forward. David Hollerith here with more on this whole story. David, where are we headed and where is SBF headed? Well, over the weekend, a Wall Street Journal report shared with us that from the Bahamas that um, Bankman freed was going to waive his objection to being extradited to the U.S. where he faces criminal charges, including eight counts of fraud. In a Bahamian court today, that appeared less certain, at least according to one of SPS lawyers who was surprised to see his client in court. While it remains to be seen whether Bankman Freed will agree to extradition, legal sources familiar with the case tell us that Bankman Freed may choose to waive extradition because he stands a better chance of getting bail in the U.S. federal court. If brought to the U.S., his case has been assigned to U.S. District Judge Ronnie Abrams, a former federal prosecutor in Manhattan. That's as much as we know as of now. 
All right, and David, the collateral damage from the FTX collapse that has continued to spread with Binance now buying a Voyager digital assets for a billion bucks. Now, FTX was initially expected to uh, buy, I guess, plan to uh, buy Voyager here before they failed, just in terms of what this means for co more consolidation within the industry and whether or not this maybe, I guess, raises the same concerns that we've had over the last several weeks when it comes to crypto. Shauna, there's a, a, a bit of a feeling of Groundhog's Day um, with this deal. Um, Binance US is a separate uh, entity from Binance, the um, larger company. It does license Binance's brand, um, and both are majority owned by Shengping Zhao, the um, CEO of Binance. Um, that being said, uh, FTX going bankrupt has opened up uh, Voyager's assets, and w in which case Binance US has jumped in, and they're paying about $400 million less than, uh, than Voyager was at the time. Um, in return, it's the, the de these deals normally work where um, uh, Voyager customers could potentially receive their bankruptcy um, reimbursements through Binance US's platform, and in return, Binance US would potentially uh, gain customers. Now, that being said, um, there is some questions here about, um, you know, what to make of this with Binance. Uh, last week, uh, its accounting firm, uh, Mazers, uh, dropped it, and uh, along with other crypto clients. And, and that has been a, a point of concern, especially as uh, crypto exchanges are sort of at an all-time low of trust with their customers. Binance is trying to shore up that trust. And again, it's a separate entity from Binance US, but you have to have to assume that they're related and that they both have the same majority stakeholder. Um, Binance is hoping to has already engaged with another accounting firm. Um, sources familiar with the matter tell us, um, but as far as when a more transparent report of their reserves holding come out comes out, um, we're still waiting to see that. Now that being said, um, this. Uh, Binance U.S. Voyager deal is still pending approval from a from a bankruptcy court judge, and that hearing will take place on January fifth. Yeah, that that Mazers Group story that just speaks volume. Suspending all work with crypto clients. David Hollerith, great reporting. Thanks so much. Coming up, we're counting down to the closing bell on Wall Street. Stay with us here on Yahoo Finance Live. See if some of that red goes away.
All right, just a few minutes away from the closing bell. A lot of red on the board to start the week. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickbury to break down some of the big movers of the day. What are we seeing, Jared? Well, we got to start with, start with the meme stocks. AMC down another 7%, and that's after last week's drubbing of the overall meme space. Now, AMC Entertainment stock, you can see down 7.8%. Move is coming after the company, is saying that since inception last year of its Ape at the Market program, remember that one, it's raised $162 million from preferred equity units. This includes $36 million in principle at an average discount of 61%. Nice discount there. AMC expects year and liquidity to range from $725 to $825 million in that same announcement. The company also saying that it's Arc Light Cinemas. Uh, that's going to be a go, but no terms are discussed. So maybe an M&A on the horizon there. And finally, a forecast for the new year. AMC expects 2023 to beat 2022 in box office receipts. And let's just, pat, let's just chart the last three years in AMC Entertainment. This was that big spike in the initial GameStop Reddit phenomenon in February of 2021, and it's been pretty much ever since then uh, downhill. Now, we want to move on or actually stick with the uh, space here, meme stocks, Coinbase. Now, kind of uh, flipping this over into crypto a little bit, Coinbase hitting a 52-week low today, and that's as Bitcoin and other flagship crypto assets sell off sharply after peaking last week. And by the way, that peak was a multi-month high for some of those assets. So let's just part and kind of contemplate what's going on with Coinbase here. This is from inception, and we can see that the initial price was in the 300s. And that is not a misprint. That price right now that you see today is $35.20. Just want to point out something else here. This is a market cap look. Coinbase at $9.216 billion. And this is going to be, remember that number, $9.221 billion now, uh, compared with Dogecoin, 9640 So yes, Coinbase has sunk in market cap uh, below that of Dogecoin. And that is, to be fair, that is an apples to oranges comparison. But nevertheless, pretty interesting to think about. Now, with a minute left here, we got Amazon that is down 3%. And this is as Avicor, Evercore is saying that Amazon is, quote, the clear winner across almost every shopping category in terms of consumer spend and intentions. Yet this stock is at a two-year low. What gives here? I think it's just par for the course what's been going on in the industry. Now, if the best in class here, Amazon, not performing that well, you have to imagine, guys, what their competitors maybe are doing. Yeah, it's interesting that Evercore note because they do uh, write that th the numbers suggest ongoing softness in online retail. Another dour note about the uh, macro yeah. <laughs> side yeah. of the economy. Yeah, John. certainly a number of macro concerns, bell tightening likely expected here over the next couple of months or so. But they also know that Amazon is a clear winner just in terms of retail and what we are seeing play out so far this holiday season, Jared. Yep, and we'll take that, and we're just going to kick you to the final bell, the, fi the first opening final bell of the week here. Monday through Friday, we got them all lined up. That closes out today's trading day. All three of the major averages in the red, although well off their lows of the day. Dow closing off 163 points. We were off well over 300 points when we started the hour. S&P off just under 1%. The Nasdaq off about 1.5%. Here for a closer look at the broader markets, what we could expect heading into the new year. We want to bring in Liz Young, so Vice Head of Investment Strategy. Liz, it's great to see you. So before we dive into your 2023 look ahead, let's talk about what's been going on in the markets of late because we have the S&P lower for the fourth trading day in a row certainly has seemed to turn a little bit when it comes to momentum. How does this set us up for the final two weeks of the year? Well, Shauna, there had been a lot of optimism for a year-end rally or what everybody calls a Santa Claus rally. And I think that optimism faded when we heard from the Fed last week, where they just reiterated their hawkish stance and actually led everybody to believe that they would actually hold rates much higher for even longer than, than maybe we originally expected. Now, the difference is that when you look at what the bond market has been telling us, we've got curve inversions at the twos tens, at the three month tenure, and then at what's called the near term forward spread, the bond market is screaming that things are not getting better, they're getting worse. And then you've got the macro environment, we have data rolling in that continues to look weaker and weaker. Uh, things that we're waiting to see, maybe some weakness in the labor market to come in December, January. 
but earnings also being revised down. So it seemed as if the stock market was the only thing that hadn't gotten the memo. And I think what we're seeing right now is more of a right sizing of those valuations. You mentioned earnings it, uh, revised down. You expect further downward revision. I do, because right now the expectations are for basically flat growth year over year, 2023 versus 2022. And that seems a little bit optimistic given the environment and given the idea that wage pressures continue to be high, companies are going to be uh, having to pay those higher costs. And here's the thing that I think people are sort of thinking about, but maybe not realizing the big impact of is, if inflation falls, that means revenue falls too. A lot of companies have benefited from inflation and getting more revenue because you can sell things for a higher price. Uh, that pricing power had been really, really strong through 2022. It may not be as strong in 2023. So if revenue falls and costs don't fall at the same speed, that's obviously going to pressure margins. So I do expect more downward revisions early in 2023 when companies have to come out and start talking about what their plans are for the rest of the year. Hey, Liz Pross here. So does that mean that stocks are just still overpriced, relatively speaking, to where they maybe should be? You know, we've seen tech kind of come down really far pretty fast. And, you know, are those, is that a value now? Uh, so there are some tech stocks that people are calling value now because of where they're trading. Here's what I would say about valuations. They're always a relative game. So there's not some magic number that I would say, okay, that's when it gets to, when it gets to that level, that's a buy. But we got up to 17.8 times forward earnings in this last rally. So the rally that started on that October low and took us through the last uh, two weeks ago or so. 17.8 times forward earnings was above the five and 10 year average. So Looking at that, you can't really assume in an environment where you've got the 10-year treasury at 3.5%, and over that 10-year period, it was at 2.1%, or when you've got, obviously, higher rates continuing to rise more, it just doesn't make sense for stocks to be that highly valued. You have to believe in multiple expansion if you believe that we are going to continue in that bull market. So I do think that valuations need to come back down to earth a bit, especially given this environment. Liz, how does this set us up just in terms of the debate about a recession, whether or not we're in one? And then you asked the question in your look ahead, how we're going to know when a real recession is here. Help explain that to us, because I think that's what so many investors have been asking themselves for so long now. Yeah, I mean, look, the debate earlier this year was that technically we had one. We had two consecutive quarters of negative GDP. So everybody said, OK, that's it. It's over. But it wasn't over because it didn't reset the business cycle. And that's something else that I talk about in my outlook is that you have to respect the business cycle. If we are decidedly late cycle, which I believe we are right now, in order to transition back into early cycle, you usually need a recession in between late and early. The good thing about having a recession, if there is one, is that it should cure the inflation problem. We cannot subsist with inflation at these levels. So if we left inflation alone and didn't do anything about it, it would put us in a recession anyway. So the question of how do we know it's the one, First of all, I think there would be a lot more macroeconomic data that's telling us things have weakened. We didn't really have that kind of data in the first half of this year. The big thing that you want to watch is the labor market. So the labor market has been, as we know, historically tight all year. We haven't lost a lot of jobs. We've heard headlines about layoffs, but it's been mostly contained to the tech sector, which makes up a very small percentage of the overall workforce in the United States. If that starts to spread into other sectors, which I expect that it will, we will start seeing it in the data that the labor market is weakening. Now, it doesn't necessarily need to get catastrophically bad. So that's why you're starting to hear people talk about maybe it's a mild recession, maybe it's an average recession, maybe it's a deep recession. The other thing about this is that what's different this time is if we go into a recession, we're going into it from a very strong labor market place. So it may not need to get as deep and as painful as far as labor goes as previous recessions. And Liz, because of that setup, what's the strategy you recommend going forward into 23? So for now, I'd still be waiting this out. And, and here's what I would say to all investors. You don't always have to be doing something. Sometimes it is better to just sit on the sidelines and wait for some of the uncertainties to subside. I would expect stocks to move lower into the end of the year. I don't think we're going to have a big year-end rally. There's not a lot of news that's going to happen between now and December 31st, so there's not a whole lot to be trading around, and volume is just lighter. I think we can look into January, start 
hearing from companies, let earnings season begin, and then see where things go. But again, watch those valuations. I think that we're going to get back down under 16 times on the S&P. And then when I come back on the show, maybe I'll be telling you that I've turned a little bit more bullish. Liz Young, I hope we are. <laughs> I hope you do turn more bullish. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Coming up, Mesa Airlines and American are ending their partnership, but United's waiting in the wings. The company's CEO tells us what's in store for the regional carrier next. Mesa Air Group shares a popping today. The stock moved on news that it is winding down its operations with American Airlines and finalizing a new agreement with United Airlines. Here with more on this is Jonathan Ornstein, Mesa Air Group chairman and CEO. Jonathan, it's great to have you back here on Yahoo Finance. So I know you sent a memo to your employees saying that you had negotiated a mutual agreement to end your contract with American. I also want to bring up that American has said that it was due to concerns about Mesa's ability to be a a reliable partner. This is according to Derek Kerr, the CFO of American Airlines. So just walk us through the decision, what happened, and how you're set up going into 2023. Yeah, first, let me address that. I mean, it, it is truly, um, it's just it's just disingenuous. We actually went to American, and when we first wanted to set up a meeting to talk about a wind down, they said, don't even bother coming to Dallas. We don't want to talk about a wind down. Um, in fact, you know, they wanted, not only did they try to incentivize us to, they did a, offered us an extension of the contract. So, I mean, I just have a problem with that because it's, you know, really denigrates the hard work of all my people. And the bottom line is we went to them because we were losing so much, like $5 million a month and just said, look, we need to get out, um, so that we can continue to operate the business and provide jobs for, you know, 3,500 people. So, I mean, we initiate it, we discuss it, and I think, you know, I, I think that should be clear. And, and what really makes it even more irksome is the fact that, you know, for years, uh, Mesa has outperformed American Mainline in terms of, you know, reliability. Um, now, recently, with the pilot shortage, obviously, it's been more challenging. 
But, you know, we've been partners with, with American and their predecessors for a long time. And so I just think that it was unfair to say that um, about, you know, my people who I think really do a great job and work really hard and work really hard through the pandemic. Um, I, I just think it's unfair. And I, I want to straighten that out because we, in fact, sure. initiated those conversations and really pressed to be able to wind down the agreement. We appreciate your candor on that, uh, Mr. Ornstein. So what is the value add United versus American? Well, you know, United has a great long-term future in terms of their, their, their growth plan. They just ordered enough aircraft that the aircraft they ordered alone would represent the sixth largest airline in the world. You know, Scott Kirby, the CEO there, has been a friend of mine since we worked on the America West bankruptcy together in 1992. Andrew Nacella, these are all guys I've worked with at Continental, uh, their CFO, Jerry Latterman, and I know what their vision is for the future. And, and frankly, they valued our people and our services where when pay rates went up 100 percent, which in fact were in, was initiated by American Airlines, um, they came to us and said, look, we want you to be competitive and we're willing to pay that. Um, American decided that while they were going to pay their own subsidiaries, they weren't going to pay Mesa or their other unaffiliated carriers. So, I mean, for us, the value add is that we can pay market rates to our people, particularly our pilots, where there's a shortage been, you know, created due to all the new government regulation. Um, but we now can hire people, we can retain people, and they can move to United Airlines as part of, you know, their, their, their program at Mesa. And so it's, it's a great opportunity. And I think pilots around the country have seen that. We weren't able to do that before uh, with substandard wages where we just weren't competitive. And if our partners were not willing to pay, I mean, it's not like we can raise fares. I mean, we don't control the fares. We can't change our schedule. They control the schedule. So we really were between a rock and a hard spot and just had to make a, had to make a change and move our operations to a party that valued that and was willing to pay for that. And that's what we did when we moved to United. Hey, Jonathan, so as we sort of enter or we're in the midst of holiday travel season, are you guys seeing a big kind of pick, pick up in demand? And, and how do you guys sort of plan for that with, with, you know, do you buy new planes? How do you expand capacity? No, I mean, right now, capacity is absolutely just being driven by pilot supply. Um, you know, if we could, if we had more pilots, we would be flying more. I mean, you know, airfares have gone up a lot over the year. It's not necessarily because of demand. It's just because of supply. I mean, everybody is smaller because of, you know, what's going on on the pilot side. I mean, we would probably be flying, you know, 40% more if we had pilots to do that. So, you know, when we look at the, the, the holiday seasons, it's just it obviously the problem becomes exacerbated because we can only fly so much. Um, you know, again, you know, this is all due to some regulations that required, you know, made the requirements for pilots much, much harder, uh, you know, in terms of the total amount of hours they had. And it really just plugged up the supply line. And we're now basically working our way through that. Um, and as I said, with United, they're providing us with the level that we can, you know, to pay pilots and the rest of our staff, frankly, which we also have shortages, for example, in maintenance, where we can attract and retain the people we need to fly the airplanes as much as we have demand for, which is a lot more than we have right now. That's for sure. So, Jonathan, what does this mean for airfare? Because it's still up in November, up over 30 percent on a year over year basis in terms of any consumers, any flyers seeing any relief. Is that six to 12 months, maybe even longer just in terms of the outlook there, uh, given the fact that we do have such a shortage? I think it's going to take some time. I mean, you know, the, the problem could obviously be solved by changing some of these regs. But I, I, most people will agree that the likelihood of, of, of Washington doing that is pretty remote. So we've all sort of worked as best we can to train people as fast as possible. But remember, the training that pilots go through is rigorous and our failure rate is over 25 percent. So, you know, the fact of the matter is it's just going to take time. And I would suggest that as long as demand holds up, which, of course, you know, is questionable in this environment, um, you know, there's you're going to see, you know, continued pressure on pricing. It's unfortunately uh, part of the downside of these new regulations. Mesa Chairman and CEO Jonathan Ornstein, good to see you again, sir. Thank you. All right, millions of Americans expected to hit the road and the skies this holiday season. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Carrie Hannon with what travelers can expect this week. What's it going to be out there this week, Carrie? I'm, I'm a little <laughs> nervous. I'm traveling on Christmas Day. Oh, uh, Dave, it's going to be busy, busy, busy. I mean, they're saying that most people are going to be hitting the roads versus flying, although flights are going to be packed. They're going to be full to capacity. 
up maybe 17% from last year is what Hopper is saying. But but in fact, it's going to be one of the busiest holiday seasons probably in the last two decades, according to AAA. So, um, you know, everyone needs to brace themselves for a lot of people saying, hey, I'm getting out of town. I'm going home. Uh, I'm leaving home or I'm going home, one or the other, but expect it to be congested. Here's some good news, though, Dave. The thing is, with remote work and hybrid work, those crunch travel days aren't going to be as bad as they used to be. You know, Friday, Thursday and Friday this week are still going to be busy. But because people can flex and work remotely, leave a little bit earlier, work from where their destination is, we're seeing a little bit of easing there on the roadways, as well as people have booked flights with a little more flexibility on each side of those peak travel days. So that's a really good thing. The other good news is, hey, gas prices have come down, right? They are, the national averages are below where they were a year ago. So this is promising. If you're hitting the road, this is good news. It's a bright spot for sure. So I think that's really people need to, TSA, I, they had an announcement out today saying, hey, we're prepared. We can handle the surge of traffic of passengers coming through, but they're expecting the big days for them December 22nd. And December 30th will be the biggest travel days. They're saying, if you can believe it, 10 minutes uh, if you have a TSA pre-check in the lines and 30 minutes if you don't. Uh, we'll see if that works. That certainly sounds like an important tip for people who will be flying this holiday season. What else can people do who plan to travel over the next week or two? Yeah, Shana, I think the good thing first, as we said before, tr if you can be flexible on your travel days and times, that's really important. Keep an eye on the weather. They, that's the big sort of thing that throws a monkey wrench into all this. And National Weather Service is calling for some storms, at least in the East Coast. Um, but what I tell people to do is, you know, and it's sage old advice. We've all said it. Get to the airport two hours ahead of time if you're flying. OK, just plan for wait times. Number two, if you can get that first flight out of the day, if you haven't booked your flights yet, Go for the first flight so you don't get, you know, bumped because of an issue uh, on a flight before yours. And if get the mobile app, you know, download your air if you're flying that the carrier's app. I had a thing at Thanksgiving where our flight was canceled from a mechanical problem. Uh, American Airlines switched us to another terminal, another airplane. We we're going to miss our our connection flight in Dallas. And in fact, because we had our mobile app, we were able to quickly uh, get to that next flight. So we did have a connection and it all worked well. So it's really important if there's a snafu that, that you can get to your airline and get the information fast. Very helpful tips ahead of the uh, travel uh, heavy weekend. Carrie Hanning, great to have you. Thanks so much for filling us in yeah. there. All right, well, coming up, Fortnite maker Epic Games agreeing to pay $520 million fine to the FTC. Find out what has a software developer in hot water when we come back.
Ours is not a system of justice where foot soldiers go to jail and the masterminds and ringleaders get a free pass. The evidence clearly suggests that President Trump conspired with others to submit slates of fake electors to Congress and the National Archives. An historic day on Capitol Hill today in its final public session, the January 6th committee asking the Department of Justice to charge former President Trump with insurrection, obstruction, and conspiracy. Senior columnist Rick Newman here with where this goes next. Rick, good to see you. This has never before happened, but at the same time holds no real legal weight, right? Right. Uh, now, it, do, it, it, does a, it does several things. So first of all, this is basically a summary of uh, what's been going on with the January 6th committee all year. They've had several hearings and in, in a, uh, you know, in one of these uh, additional hearings that was the familiar format, very made for TV, TV friendly. It only lasted about an hour and 15 minutes. They got right to the point instead of a lot of instead of a lot of blathering by politicians like we usually see. Um, they laid out everything that they have found in, you know, what they're trying to make a pithy format. And then, of course, these criminal referrals to the Justice Department. And there will be a very detailed report that the committee will publish by the end of the year that will probably be, who knows, hundreds or thousands of pages long with all the evidence they found. Now, just because uh, a congressional committee does this, refers uh, charges to the Justice Department, that, that doesn't mean anything. That does not obligate the Justice Department to do anything. Uh, so, so I think what you could say that the House committee has done is create a blueprint for uh, Justice Department prosecutors if they choose to pursue it. They've put a lot of evidence on the record, including hundreds of witnesses who testified. Um, so they're kind of giving the Justice Department a head start, but only if the Justice Department wants to prosecute Trump. Uh, and another person they're referring for charges is the uh, outside lawyer, John Eastman, uh, who encouraged a lot of the election denial schemes. So now the question is, what will the Justice Department do? And we don't have too many hints on that with regard to January 6th. We know some other things they're pursuing against Trump, but it's a bit of a mystery what they're going to do on this one. It sure is. You know, Republicans in the Senate denied Merrick Garland a chance to be on the Supreme Court, and now he has a chance to put his stamp on American history. Sticking with Congress, a stunning piece in the New York Times today about New York Republican Congressman-elect George Santos, thought to have extensive Wall Street ties to some giants, turns out most of that is not true. What's the deal here? This was an eye-opening expose. Uh, the Times looked at what uh, he has said about his, basically his whole life history. He said he worked uh, for a time with Goldman Sachs, worked with Citicorp. Uh, uh, he had a pet charity uh, that um, turned out to be bogus. He said he, he went to Baruch College, part of the CUNY program in New York City. The Times could not find evidence of any of these things. They found, you know, Goldman Sachs said, we have no history of this guy ever working here. Citicorp said the same thing. Baruch, the college, said, no, nah, we have no record of this guy. They found evidence that he was, uh, uh, he was linked to some criminal activity in Brazil. And um, a very important detail here is that uh, Santos said nothing to the Times in response to these charges they were making. And as far as I know, he has not said anything today um, so I think now the question is, let's say most or all of this is true. What happens next? Um, I, I don't think, uh, you know, he's a, he's a brand new member of Congress. It was kind of a sleeper uh, election in, in the uh, New York's third congressional district, which is part of Long Island and Queens. And he did defeat a, a Democrat. Um, so what would happen next? Would, he, would there be pressure on him to resign? If he does resign, would there be, I guess that means there would be a special election. And let's remember, uh, the Republicans have a very, very narrow majority in uh, the House. So if this means that he might be leaving Congress uh, and that there could be a special election, it could be one fewer Republican in the House. But I'm not aware of anything that would that would require him to uh, to step down if these things turn out to be true. So then it gets to a whole question of what kind of political pressure will there be. Uh, so clearly a problem for this guy. Yes, terrific reporting. It's just remarkable, Rick, that it got to this point that he wasn't vetted prior, right. but these are extraordinary times. The story not yes. going away. Rick Newman, thanks so much. Praz? Fortnite developer Epic Games has agreed to pay a $520 million fine to the FTC, who alleges the company violated a children's privacy law and misled millions of players into making in-game purchases. Yahoo Finance's Dan Howley has the details. Dan, what exactly did they do? 
That's right, Proz. There's there's two allegations here, two separate ones. One that carries uh, a $275 million penalty, another that carries a $245 million penalty. That's going to be refunds. So let's go over the $275 million penalty first. That has to do with the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA. And essentially what the FTC alleges uh, is that uh, Fortnite did not get parents' express verifiable consent uh, when they collected personal data from children online. They also said uh, that the company required parents uh, who requested that their children's personal information be deleted to jump through unreasonable hoops uh, and sometimes failed to honor those requests. It also says that it enabled live by default uh, text and video communications for users, uh, and that that resulted in some children and teens being bullied, threatened, harassed, and exposed to dangerous and psychological traumatizing issues. Uh, so they're paying uh, the $275 million penalty to settle that issue. And then the other $245 million in refunds has to do uh, with what the FTC alleged were uh, so-called dark patterns, where uh, by it was too difficult for uh, people to try to get refunds for certain purchases they made and too easy to make those purchases to begin with. So uh, they said that the uh, Fortnite's counterintuitive, inconsistent and confusing button configuration led players to incur unwanted charges based on the press of a single button. They said that some players could be waking up their phones uh, and just happen to press a button and make a purchase through the game. So now uh, Fortnite says, Fortnite developer Epic says that they're going to provide $245 million in refunds based on that issue. All right, and also some more trouble for Meta over in the EU. What can you tell us about these antitrust charges, Dan? Yeah, this is basically a uh, statement of objections that the EU's European Commission is sending to Meta. So it's not necessarily an antitrust suit or anything along those lines quite yet, but it does have to do with Facebook Marketplace. Uh, and the European Commission is basically saying, uh, you know, it looks as though Meta is trying to box out other online marketplaces uh, by ensuring that Facebook Marketplace is a part of Facebook proper. So uh, if you have Facebook, uh, no matter what, you're going to get access to Facebook Marketplace. They say that that's unfair to them. Uh, they also say that Meta unilaterally imposes unfair trading conditions on competing online classified ad services, which advertise on Facebook or Instagram. So they're concerned about the terms and conditions that authorize Meta to use ad-related data from those competitors to the benefit of Facebook Marketplace. And so, uh, as I said, this isn't necessarily uh, an antitrust issue just yet. Uh, sometimes we don't get anything out of this. Sometimes we can see changes from companies. But uh, to see that this is going forward, uh, as far as at least a statement to Meta, is a little concerning on their part. Some bad behavior, big tech. Dan Howley, thanks so much. Coming up, inflation is coming for your Christmas trees. The CEO of Stu Leonard tells us what, what changes consumers are making. And holiday spending could leave an unpleasant surprise for credit card users in January. Don't go anyway. Away.
Holiday spending is up this season despite the economic turmoil of the last few years. But savings, though, they are down, falling more than 21 percent since 2020. So are Americans in store for a holiday hangover in the new year? Yahoo Finance contributor Vera Givens joining us now with more. And Vera, I guess how concerned should we be that spending is up yet savings are down pretty, pretty drastically off more than 20 percent? I know. I think you're totally right that the holiday hangover will be coming to consumers. The problem this year is that while we trimmed our Christmas list and we were trying to like winnow down the list to just give presents to our closest loved ones, our friends, our family, the problem is we kind of went big on the gifts. Like a lot of us bought experiences. We went for more thoughtful, meaning, meaningful gifts. And because so many of, of us are cash poor right now, we just put it on the credit card. We have no plan to pay down this debt. We just charge it without giving any kind of afterthought because this year in particular, I feel like a lot of Americans just want to live. They want to celebrate. They're tired of uh, how life has been in the past couple of years. They want to enjoy, and they're not necessarily thinking about the consequences. Hey, Vera. So when we look at sort of like the pandemic effect and sort of spending from, you know, uh, stimulus checks, that sort of has changed behavior too, hasn't it? Oh, totally. Yeah, that's a great point because I think when the stimulus checks went out, everybody was feeling flush with cash, paying down our debt became a big priority. I mean, there was nowhere to spend money necessarily. People were just staying home. They weren't going out. They weren't going to bars. They weren't traveling at all. So the spending opportunities were really limited and the savings rate virtually by default hit an all-time high of a little over 33% in April 2020. It stayed elevated through 2021. And if you fast forward to today, our savings rate has plummeted to a 17-year low of just over 2%. So inflation is largely to blame for that, along with the fact that wage growth isn't keeping up with inflation. Yes, inflation's simmering a little bit, but wage growth just isn't there. All right, Vera, Vera Gibbons, nice to see you, my friend. Thanks so much for that. Thank Merry you. Christmas to you. One of the quintessential holiday experiences is picking out the perfect Christmas tree. This year, got a little less joyful because it's now a lot more expensive. Stu Leonard Jr. is the president and CEO of Stu Leonard's seven grocery locations. Always joins us around the holidays and always good to see you, Stu. What is the deal with Christmas tree inflation? How it is impacting shoppers? This is the first time I've ever put the star on the top of the tree without needing a step stool. <laughs> yeah, not growing. Well, you know what? It's a good point. We we just wrapped up. We sold uh, fifty thousand trees at Stu Leonard this year, and that's fast and furious uh, that happens right now. But what you noticed was people really did like yourself buy trees that were a foot shorter this year to save a little bit of money. Um, but you know, it's basically a forty or fifty dollar investment for for a six to seven foot tree that you'd put in your house. So. Uh, we noticed a little bit of tightening of the belt, but uh, we sold. People still bought a tree. Well, Stu, I need to go to Stu Leonard's for my tree because I paid I, quadruply more than that. I think I paid 150 yeah. bucks, almost 200 As bucks for my tree. And I don't even think my tree is six foot tall. So I need to go to Stu Leonard next year, that's for sure. But yeah. Stu, why are we seeing the cost of rising Christmas trees? It doesn't sound well, like you're passing that cost along to consumer, but more broadly speaking, we have well, seen a big jump this year. Actually, we did. We were, you know, for the smaller tree, we were um, $30 last year, and we had to raise it 10%. And here's why. I mean, it didn't cost them any more to grow it, obviously, up in Canada where they're from. But the transportation coming down, you know, um, cost them more than last year. You know, this is a whole year now, you got to think. So the fuel prices were lower. And then also he had to pay his drivers more money. And they tightened up on the transportation traveling as far as the n number of hours a driver can drive now. So um, all of those things went up in our, you know, look, it's our, he's a farmer. You know, he's not a slick business person that is part of a company, a, a Wall Street company or something. So that way we sort of agreed and, and, and took the price increase this year. Hey, Stu Prosser, I'm a big fan of Stu Leonard's. I've been going there for years. I just want to ask you about a couple of things that are kind of trends you're seeing in the food space. First of all, are you seeing any kind of uh, relief for customers in certain areas? You know, we see eggs and, and butter and things like that going really high. Is something coming down? Uh, it, you know, uh, uh, yes, there is. That's a good point. I mean, if Alexa was listening to all of our buyers right now, you would hear a lot more time. 
Looks like Stu. Yes. Oh, your back, Stu. You froze up a little bit on the audio. Are you still with I us, my friend? I froze up. Okay. How's this? Is this better? We got you. We got you now. Proceed. Okay. Um, but but uh, you're seeing meat prices right now have stabilized. They're starting to come down a little bit. Ground beef has come down a little bit. Fish prices are starting to ease a little bit right now. You're starting to hear our buyers say that the supply chain is pretty full. A couple of minor, minor disruptions. But, but you're hearing about the big poster child really is eggs right now because there is that, that, that influenza that has hit a lot of the chickens and turkey. And that has shrunk down the supply. So you're seeing the highest prices in eggs that you've ever seen. It doesn't really have anything to do with the pandemic or inflation or anything like that. It's a supply and demand issue, which we're used to all the time in the food business. Yeah, so, so Stu, are shoppers trading down, and how do they save a little money right around the holiday? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, one of the things we're noticing that if you look at these shopping carts, there's probably one less item in everybody's shopping cart. So they went to a foot shorter trees and probably one less, one less item. But you know what? Uh, right now what we're doing is, is uh, for most people to save money is I'd shop the special. You know, you always have specials every single week. There's all sorts of app deals. Um, and also, one thing, we do a lot of demos in the store to get you to taste things. Don't taste anything when you walk through because you end up buying buying it. So have a shopping list and try to discipline yourself for shopping this season. Well, that's a helpful tip for all of us, because I know for personal experience, when I've gone through Stu Leonard, I love to taste everything, and you walk out with a lot more than you had initially had on your list. But, Stu, when it comes to yep. trends, what people are cooking this year, what people are buying, <laughs> what is the top one or two or three things that you have been selling over the last couple of weeks? Well, well, this holiday right now is all about filet mignon and, and your, your rib roast. Mm. Uh, two of the biggest items, you know, we sell trailer loads of these every every year, but 40% of all our sales are in December. So it's an enormous uh, uh, meat holiday right now. And and uh, we're... Stu, it looks like our connection is dropping out a little bit. We're going to try and reestablish it better the next time you come on. So apologies for jumping in here and cutting this short. But Stu Leonard, always great to have you. Thanks so much for joining us here this afternoon. All right, well, coming up, shares of Disney hitting a 52-week low after Avatar The Way of Water misses expectations, but theater executives are not concerned just yet. Find out why when we come back.
How you see the way of water depends upon if you're glass half full or half empty type. On one hand, James Cameron's Avatar sequel came in below expectations. On the other, it crushed the original, which is the highest grossing film ever, and even top Top Gun 2's opening weekend, which is this year's box office champ. Ali Canal here with her take. <laughs> which is it, Ali? Well, if you're an investor, I think you're a little more pessimistic because Disney shares, they close at their lowest level since March 2020 on the heels of this disappointment, down 4.8%. Now, the studio had anticipated a range between $135 million to $158 million for the domestic opening weekend. Industry analysts had anticipated even higher than that, $175 million plus. But the results very much disappointed, $134 million domestically, internationally it was a bit better, 300.5 million overseas. Now, industry executives, IMAX CEO Richard Galvan, he told Yahoo Finance he is not worried about this whatsoever. At the end of the day, this is a movie that was never going to be front-loaded, that as the holiday season progresses, kids get off of school, families make their plans, they will go and see this movie. But it definitely puts the pressure on things a little bit to make sure that it does live up to those expectations. And we continue to see great growth in weeks two, three, four, et cetera. But I do anticipate that this is nothing to worry about. Like you said, the original Avatar, that debuted 77 million domestically, went on to become the highest grossing film of all time. Cameron's films, they really are like this. They don't have a ton of people rushing out in the beginning like you normally see with a Marvel superhero film. So I do think that this is going to eventually come back on top in a way that exhibitors really appreciate. How big of an impact did China have on this opening, considering last the original was a huge hit in China? Huge hit in China, and the Chinese market, they've been pretty re restrictive when it comes to the types of films that they're even greenlighting in the country. But this film delivered big in China, 57.1 million in opening weekend ticket sales in that market. That was the top overseas market for the sequel. Again, below expectations of around 100 million, but maybe that's because of what's going on in their COVID situation. Beijing has that zero COVID policy. Cases are ticking very high in the country. So so consumer behavior patterns might have changed there. So industry insiders are really reassessing how the success will look like in China, maybe more of an ebb and flow than what we previously anticipated. So the China market is going to be very important. The original avatar, 200 million roughly came from China markets. So hopefully the sequel will continue to just rack up those numbers overseas. I saw it. My, I loved it. It was an incredible theater experience. My 10-year-old liked it equally. So if you want to review, absolutely have to see this in the theater. By the way, IMAX is down, Cinemark is down, AMC is down. All of them got hammered on yep. this uh, under expectation. Ali, thank you. Let's talk about some other movers after hours with Shauna. All right, Dave, we got four stocks for you here. We have Heiko Stitch Fix, American Airlines, and Fubo TV. Let's kick it off with Heiko. That stock up nearly 2% in extended trading. Some news out from the company. The company posting record operating income and net sales for its most recent quarter. They also raised their dividend by about 11%. Net sales beat the street's expectations, 609.6 million. EPS was in line with expectations year to date, Heiko is actually in the green. It's an aerospace company. If you're not familiar with it, but up just around three and a half percent so far this year. Let's flip it over to Stitch Fix. That stock up nearly 4% after hours. Kofi Amu Gottfried, he is the chief marketing officer of DoorDash. Stitch Fix naming him to their company's board. It looks like the street is pretty excited about this appointment with shares moving to the upside in extended trading. Now, Gottfried has held senior positions at Meta and Bacardi in in the past stitch fix year to date looking at significant losses with the stock off just around 83 percent over the past six months it hasn't been able to regain any of its momentum really with losses of nearly 50 percent Let's take a look at American Airlines releasing its 8K filing. It's cut its total debt $5.6 billion since July 2021. We're seeing slight movement to the upside in after hours trading. Over the past six months, we're still looking at losses of about 3.5%. The stock closed at $12.48 a share today. Year to date, those losses of just about 30%. And wrapping up with Fubo TV, taking a look at this name, the stock up just around 1% in extended trading. The company announcing a carriage agreement 
with Scripps Network. So pushing further and further into entertainment and news. And Fubo TV has got to do something to help turn shares around. We're looking at losses of just about 86% year to date. The stock closed just above two bucks a share today. Pross? My stock to watch for tomorrow is a global growth indicator, FedEx. This giant, the shipping giant reports its second quarter earnings Tuesday after the bell. Analysts are expecting earnings of 280 a share on 23.7 billion on revenue. Last quarter, FedEx surprised investors with a dismal Q1 report, which they blamed on weakened demand. They also announced a series of cost-cutting measures. We'll be watching for an update on those cost cuts and what executives are saying about holiday shipping today. Wait. Today, today, Evercore ISI analyst lowered its price target on FedEx at 202 from 225, saying demand is seemingly softening at a greater than expected pace across most markets. Coming up, Lionel Messi and Argentina win their first World Cup in 36 years. You don't want to miss the celebration footage. Stay tuned. That was the scene in Buenos Aires after Argentina's first World Cup final. Victory since 1986 and arguably the greatest sports game that was ever played in this man's opinion. Arides Ferre, who was born in Buenos Aires, has been following the run closely. She took it all in yesterday. Inez, nice to see you. I'm curious just if you could put into words what this means for the entire country. I don't think there could ever be a similar win for the United States. No, I mean, look, for Argentina, this is huge because in Argentina, everybody lives, eats, and breathes soccer, football. Uh, this is something that fans have been waiting for for years, for Lionel Messi, his uh, such an illustrious career, and to be able to cement this with a World Cup victory. This is what everyone was waiting for. Now, I was at a bar in New York City, and there were about, half of them were 
France fans. The other half were Argentine fa fans. Here's the moment where Argentina clinches the World Cup victory. There you go. There you see. That's me shaking the camera quite a bit because I was so excited. And I was screaming out Messi, Messi, because this is such a victory for him and just all of Argentina. Look, Argentina's economy is in the gutter. It has been for decades now. Inflation there is over 90% year over year. Politics are just as divided as they are here. And for Argentina to be able to win this just says we are excellent at the most popular sport in the world. And we are the champions in a worldwide uh, arena for this, guys. And is it like your jersey there? Nice, nice, uh, nice work there. Uh, so, you know, I want, to talk, I want to talk about Lionel Messi because, you know, for me and a number of soccer fans, we wanted to see him win that because it was just how he's done everything in the sport and really see him get that one big, you know, accolade that, that he's been missing. Do you think he equals now the status of Diego Maradona in, in your home oh, country? Yeah. Oh, yes, most definitely. And, and I mean, that had been the comparison for years, right? And for years, he was he's just such an amazing soccer player, but he wasn't able to clinch the World Cup victory. And uh, in the international stage, I mean, until he got Copa America, and then now with this World Cup victory, now this really cements it. And there was one commentator that kind of put it, wrapped a bow around it and said, there are few times in life where you really get a Hollywood ending. And in this case... Mm -hmm. He got that Hollywood ending and he had a supporting cast because Argentina's goalie was amazing as well. So uh, this is his Hollywood ending. And look, it couldn't be a more perfect ending and a game that made my heart stop so many times. <laughs> so happy for you, Inez Ferre. Congratulations to Argentina and to Lionel Messi. It was a beautiful World Cup final. We appreciate you sharing that video with us. Guys, it was remarkable. It was probably the greatest game ever played, at least on this stage, and the two best players in the world playing at their very best. Lionel Messi notched a little history off the field on Instagram, the most liked Instagram post by an athlete of all time. North of 48 million people have already liked that post. Just consider that. Now, he broke the record set by himself, uh, which was a uh, Louis Vuitton ad, but he's still well short of the most <laughs> liked Instagram post of all time, which is what? Do you guys remember? Wait. The Ronaldo? egg. It uh, is the egg. Just the simple photo no. of the egg. Oh, yes. 56 yes. million likes. That was because the Kardashians likes. pumped it up. That, that is yeah. going to be a tough the photo. The egg is going to gonna be a really tough act to follow. It certainly is. And this game was so exciting. Really, it wasn't even just Instagram. Really, across social media, we saw people so excited throughout the game. And then, of course, once it was over, Usain Bolt tweeted out this was the best World Cup ever. A number of actors and actresses across the country here in the U.S., where soccer arguably, clearly, not as big as as it is everywhere else in the world. Essentially, people were so excited for the games. You could walk around New York City. You could walk around so many towns, cities throughout the country, and you really saw the excitement and people getting more and more into the World Cup. So it kind of sets us up with how much excitement maybe we'll see when the World Cup is here and across North America in a couple of years. Yeah, I just want to add, you know, France, too, a remarkable game. They're a young team, really exciting team. Good, great to watch them in that next World Cup in the States. Yeah. Also, the Women's World Cup coming up. I'm getting excited about that. Yeah, certainly. Well, Argentina is getting excited about pallets of Budweiser oh, headed yep. their way. You remember, they banned sales of beer too late in this process to stop the manufacturing. So Budweiser is sending all of that beer to Argentina for an enormous celebration. That parade will be unlike, quite frankly, anything we have ever seen as far as a sports celebration goes. It's going to be remarkable. And uh, Budweiser is going to manage to... Make even, perhaps. Yeah, Budweiser following through on its promise that it made uh, several weeks ago. All right, guys. Well, that does it for us today on Yahoo Finance Live. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you right back here again tomorrow night.